Good evening and welcome to another presentation from the Agency for Public Information, the API. The API is your official source for up-to-date information on government's plans, programs, and policies. I am Shana Daniel with this evening's presentation. Just ahead, Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez explains that it is in the national interest of St. Vincent and the Grenadines that it affirms and strengthens further formal diplomatic relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan. Former Director of NEMO, Mr. Howie Prince, and former Director of the Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit, Mr. Ellsworth John, talk with us about expectations of their new ambassadorial positions in the USA and Cuba, respectively. Stay with us for the details to these stories just after News Watch. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us for Newswatch. I'm Ashi Siasam. The Leyu Learning Research Center is now retrofitted with 10 desktop and 2 laptop computers complements the government and people of the Republic of China on Taiwan. The Ambassador of the Republic of China on Taiwan to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Bo Shengo, handed over the computers to Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs and to Parliamentary Representative for Central Leeward, Sir Louis Straker, at a handing over ceremony held at the Leiu Learning Research Center on Tuesday, August 30th. His Excellency said that ICT has become a very important item of cooperation between both countries and Taiwan is pleased to assist the residents of Central Leeward in this regard. It's a pleasure today for me to, uh, to be with uh, Sir Louis Straker uh, to uh, this uh, handover ceremony. Uh, we, we do hope that these computers, uh, laptops and desktop will uh, serve its purpose here uh, for good use in the future. Meanwhile, Sir Louis Straker pointed out that there is no country in the world that has provided more for the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as Taiwan has, and he is grateful for its assistance. Taiwan has been an excellent friend of St. Vincent and the Grenadine, Grenadines, and it has given tremendously for the development of this country in every sector of this country. Every sector, education has been uh, one of the areas that it has given so much to. And we are extremely grateful to Taiwan for what it has done. Rosmond Lane Lorraine of the Division of Adults and Continuing Education also expressed gratitude to the government and people of Taiwan for its assistance. We are grateful for everything that you're doing to help in the development of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And in this way, our educational aspect. We at the, I mean, at the Adult and Continuing Education are happy to have these computers to be used in the, the central liberal community. And we, we, are, we know that we're going to put these computers to work in the further development of our nation and in IT. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has benefited significantly from the Republic of China on Taiwan in the area of ICT since the signing of the first phase of the pilot agreement on ICT cooperation between both countries in 2010. The Windward Islands Farmers Association, WINFA, held a policy advocacy capacity building training workshop on Wednesday, August 31st at the National Insurance Services Conference Room. The workshop, which was funded by the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program, was held to discuss policy issues relating to the environment and agriculture and issues affecting civil society organizations. Coordinator of WINFA, Kozel Fraser, outlined the expected outcomes of the workshop. We hope that the passion within the civil society movement would be rekindled even today, that we hope that we would ensure 
that no one is left behind, that we would represent the interest even as our capacity is built of those persons who we represent and that we, are, we would ensure as well that those persons who are ahead are going in the right direction. Representative of the National Steering Committee of the Jeff Small Grants Program, Kenry Koshi, said his organization is pleased to partner with Winfor on hosting this workshop, which will be beneficial to the participants. At the end of it, you are going to not just gather a lot of information, but you are going to be geared up to actually make an impact, how you can influence policymakers in agriculture and environmental issues. That was a representative of the National Steering Committee of the Jeff Small Grants Program, Kenrick Kwashi. And finally, the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, PAHO WHO, held a workshop to train Caribbean health personnel in the clinical management of severe neurological complications related to the Zika virus, such as the Guillain Barry syndrome. Since the Zika virus was detected in Brazil in May 2015. 45 countries and territories in the Americas have reported transmission of the disease. Several countries reported severe neurological cases associated with infection by this virus, mainly transmitted by the bite of an infected Aegis aegypti mosquito. The two-day workshop, which was held from Thursday, September 1st to Friday, September 2nd, aimed to build the capacity of health professionals in the the Caribbean so that they are better prepared to detect and treat patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Based on scientific research, there is a consensus that the Zika virus can trigger the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Since June 2016, the number of cases of the Guillain-Barre syndrome has been increasing in the Caribbean. For this reason, PAHO WHO is working to expand and strengthen the professional capacity to provide adequate medical attention to these cases. Here's where we end News Watch for this evening. I'm Ashisi Sam. Do stay with us for the rest of our programming. Protecting our marine environment Our forests, our wildlife for our children Pollution of our rivers and beaches Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsville Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours Let's Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. Thank you for staying with us. If you're just joining us, then welcome. This is a presentation from the API. Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, has written a comprehensive paper on why St. Vincent and the Grenadines must maintain diplomatic relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan. Speaking at a press conference on August 30th, 2016, Prime Minister Gonzalez shared aspects of the paper with members of the media. Dr. Gonzalez describes the switching of relations between the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China on Taiwan back and forth as an obsolete option in today's world. I want to read very briefly the eight or so compelling statements and conclusions in this paper, which I have elaborated upon in the discussion. I begin by affirming that it is overwhelmingly in accord with the national interests of St. Vincent and Grenadines that it maintains and strengthens further formal diplomatic relations with the Republic of China, Taiwan. 
This conclusion takes account of several critical factors, including the real condition of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as a vulnerable small island developing state in the Caribbean, the history of the very beneficial relations with Taiwan, the actual condition and circumstances of Taiwan, including its developed country status and its shared fundamental values with St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the huge and increasing trade and investment ties between Taiwan and mainland China, the ongoing rapprochement between the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China, particularly since 2008, and continuing, and the extant possibilities already made manifest of St. Vincent and the Grenadines interfacing with the People's Republic of China, for example, in the Caribbean Development Bank, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the United Nations. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines trades both with the People's Republic of China and Taiwan, and they're all members of the World Trade Organization. All those are very important issues. Secondly, the issue of St. Vincent and the Grenadines' relations with the Republic of China, Taiwan, is not an ideological one. For or against mainland China, it centers on our country's national interests, including its 35-year relationship thus far. It is a simple fact that the People's Republic of China can no longer properly be called socialist. It is, in a real sense, integrated like Taiwan in the global capitalist system with a particular brand of Chinese capitalism, but under the direction of a government headed by the Communist Party of China. The switching of relations between the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China, Taiwan, back and forth, is an obsolete option in today's world. It is archaic rubbish in our increasingly globalized world. And the place of the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China, Taiwan, and St. Vincent and Grenadines in it, in that world. Thirdly, the Republic of China, Taiwan, though much smaller than the Pub People's Republic of China in land area and population, is a wealthy developed country. Taiwan is a wealthy developed country. When I see the kind of facile thing that Taiwan population is 23.4 million and the one for mainland China is 1.34 billion, and that China is the second largest economy in the world after the United States of America in the aggregate, and that China is 3.7 million square miles in land area, and Taiwan is just under 14,000 square miles. All those are correct things to say. But you also have to say that while it is the 137th largest country in the world, Taiwan is the 21st largest economy in the world. And it has the fifth largest foreign exchange, foreign reserves in the world of any country. Now, you don't have to be the biggest country on the block to deliver benefits to us, you know. Venezuela is 27 million people. But Venezuela has delivered more benefits to us, so to Taiwan, than countries which are much larger than them with whom we have relations. Since, fourthly, since 2008, very important point I'm about to make here, 
that Taiwan and the People's Republic of China have agreed that they would desist from poaching each other's diplomatic allies and not engage in any bidding process to secure additional diplomatic alliances. Fifth, political parties, especially those in opposition, have no authority to determine the foreign policy of a country. Governs, governments make those determinations. Sixth, it is most unlikely that the opposition in this country has had any structured discussions with any leader or high-ranking or authoritative diplomat of the People's Republic of China on the matter of breaking ties with the Republic of China, Taiwan, and establishing them with the People's Republic of China. Far more likely is a transactional interaction between persons within the NDP leadership and middlemen, middlewomen, adventurers and seekers of profit who hold themselves out as representing the position of the People's Republic of China. Invariably, such middlemen, adventurers and seekers of profit are interested primarily in securing a monopoly to sell economic citizenship and our passports and to appropriate for a song primary real estate owned by the government. Seventh, in practical terms, any break by St. Vincent and the Grenadines of diplomatic relations with the Republic of China, Taiwan, would be quite costly to our country. The People's Republic of China has never in the Caribbean made up for pre-existing tangible benefits from Taiwan for any break for any country in our region that has made the break. Since the no poaching agreement between the Republic of China, Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China, within the context of their overall trade, investment, and general rapprochement, the People's Republic of China will not be encouraging any breaking of ties or be reckless in its promises to any country in the Caribbean which switches diplomatic links at this time or in the foreseeable future. And political parties in our region must be careful not to make their country's foreign policies prisoners of adventurers or seekers of profit. As I speak, the major trading partner of Taiwan is the People's Republic of China. Taiwan's Nearly 50% of Taiwan's overseas investments are in the People's Republic of China. Once upon a time, you might have been able to play one side off against the other, but those days are gone. Those days are gone. So what, what are you going to have? You think that the last country, as far as I know in this region, or one of the last ones, which sought to play one off against the other, and they, they, the country did it shamelessly. They had like, it's like in their metaphoric shop window, they had put up a for sale sign. Say, come and bid. Find out what has happened to them. That's not the way you conduct foreign policy. I... I want to say that as I've said before, I'm not saying anything adverse against the People's Republic of China. I don't have to. In order to make the case for having diplomatic relations with mainland China and to advance those relations. Look, 
Since 2001, Taiwan has given us grants in excess of $100 million EC. Currently, we owe Taiwan over $89 million EC. The only entities which we owe more money, so these are soft loans eh, with a heavy grant component, are the Caribbean Development Bank, $318 million, of which mainland China is a non-borrowing member, and we are a borrowing member. Venezuela is a non-borrowing member, too, of the Caribbean Development Bank. And then the Alba Bank, which we own soft loans, about $223 million. But if you put the, what we owe the Alba Bank and about $180 million in very soft loan financing through Petro Caribe, what we owe Venezuela is more than any of the others. And of course, we have gotten about, since 2002, about $75 million in grants from Venezuela. So if you put what we have gotten from these quote-unquote two small countries, Venezuela and Taiwan, if that is the way they want to represent it, the numbers are huge. If you are to break relations with, Venezuela, with Taiwan today, you're in opposition. You want to break them. The first thing you have to consider, what is happening to the 80 students who are currently in Taiwan? Since I negotiated that program for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it's 110 students we have, you know. The 80 students in Taiwan would be, would be the value of those scholarships is somewhere between 20 and 25 million EC dollars. Of course, Taiwan is a civilized country. They wouldn't throw out the students if you break relations with them. But they will say, you have to pay. And the students can't pay. They come to the government. Oh, you're going to take them and carry them to mainland China? You negotiate that already? And what are you doing with the $89 million? You have made an arrangement to pay, the, pay, that, pay those monies. And what about annually? The $6.7 million or thereabouts, which we get in the Civic, a grant for the Civic Development Fund, for Civic Development Projects, out of which we pay $3 million EC for 500 yes volunteers, yes workers. What are you going to do with those? You're getting that money too? And you're sitting down in opposition and you have, you have no agreement with people? I mean, it is, it is, it makes no sense. They say, people say that, look, the United States of America established relations with mainland China. They began to interface diplomatically in 1971. President Nixon and Secretary of State Kissinger. That interface led to, among other things, Taiwan, mainland China becoming a member of the United Nations, displacing the people, displacing Taiwan as representing all China. And then later, January the 1st, 1979, President Carter, who succeeded Nixon, well, Nixon and Ford and then Carter. And Ford finished Nixon's second term. They established diplomatic relations. But the point is this, what a lot of people miss. The United States of America decided on a strategic path It was in their geopolitical interest, not economic at that time, geopolitical interest, 
to establish relations with the People's Republic of China because it was part and parcel of the process, the policy of containing the Soviet Union with whom the People's Republic of China, mainland China, had developed tensions and difficulties. And of course, after Mao Zedong died in 1976, and the reformer Deng Xiaoping took over, he and his allies, he and his comrades in 1978, they began the series of reforms. The consequence of what you see now, in economic terms, in, 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 um, on mainland China. Those are the facts, you know. Now you, 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 you see the context within which we have proceeded and which we maintain relations and expand. And when I go, God willing, to, 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 to Taiwan in October, I intend to further deepen our relations. That was Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Ralph Gonzalves, speaking from Cabinet Room at a press conference on August 30th. The API's presentation will continue after this short break. Still to come, Mr. Howie Prince and Ellsworth John tell us what they expect of their new ambassadorial appointments. Good morning, Miss James. Send me a bag of chow chow, please. I want chow chow with extra salt, please. There you go. Miss, excuse me. Why are you giving these children so much salt? The children love the salt. They think it tastes better with salt like you're trying to cut myself. But don't you know that too much salt leads to hypertension, what we all know as high blood pressure? Each child just needs half a teaspoon of salt per day. But fruits do taste better without salt. You see? Kids, I want you to be like me. Don't be salty. Oh, uh -huh. I get the message now. No more salt in food. So what do we say, kids? Be like me. Don't be salty. Too much salt causes high blood pressure, kidney damage, and heart failure. Welcome back. You're viewing the presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Honorable Sir Louis Straker, in the recently concluded national consultation for heads of missions and consulates, announced several changes to this country's diplomatic posts abroad. These changes include the appointment of Director of NEMO, Mr. Howie Prince, to Council General to SVG's consulate in New York, Director of the Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit, Ellsworth John, to Ambassador-designate to the SVG's Embassy in Cuba, and the Ministry of Education's Chief Education Officer, Luan Gilchrist, as Ambassador-designate to the SVG's Embassy in Washington, D.C., USA and the OAS, as well as non-resident Ambassador to Canada. On our last program, we heard from Ms. Gilchrist about her expectations of this appointment. This evening, the API's Kisha Woodley chats with Mr. Howie Prince and Ellsworth John. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Commerce is currently hosting its Diplomatic Week and Annual Consultation. Today we have with us Mr. Howie Prince, Council General Designate, and he will be taking up position in New York. Good day, Mr. Prince. Hi, good afternoon. How are you doing? Thank I'm you. fine. Thanks for having this me. This is a recent post because people would know you from Nemo. That's right. So have you had time to even get your feet wet? <laughs> well, I'm still, I'm still taking in the, the news. I'm, I'm still getting myself accustomed to uh, being called anything other than the director of Nemo. Uh, in fact, I've been director of Nemo since 2002. That's a 14 years wow. stint a in, in the job. Um, a job that um, I'm quite happy that I was given the opportunity to do. I am quite happy that I was given the chance to serve the people of St. Vincent and Grandins in that capacity. I have now been asked to change gear, so to speak, to um, travel to New York and to provide this service to Vincentians um, who live in um, New York and cities, um, our, our states around the New York area, so as to be able to provide them with the services that they require. So 
Um, I'm just getting the feel of it. I'm, 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 I am in a week of um, consultation. So that's right, where I'm learning from the old pros, so yeah. to speak, the ambassadors. This would be like a class for you. It's, it's in, and it's one of the best classes I've had. Good. It's a perfect opportunity to learn from those persons who have been there, have seen it all, their experience and, and um, the way they have been able to get things done is, is instructive in going forward and in, in getting the job done. Good. So when will you take a position? Um, officially, it should be on or about the 1st of September. But um, there are quite a few things that need to be done, um, a few uh, paperwork and other matters that need to be taken care of. So um, I suspect that sometime early in September, I would be able to travel to New York to take up the assignment. So will your family be going with you as well? Well, the idea is generally to have family uh, uh, and um, as close as possible. Um, in the interim, I'll, I'll go and, and prepare the way for them. And um, once um, we're um, suitably satisfied that uh, there are suitable accommodation and things are in place, then I will gladly have um, the entire family join me because it's not a nice thing to be separated from your family. So um, their whole idea is to be able to carry out this assignment, but at the same time, um, keep my family close to me. Yes, I'm sure you're excited. And what expectations do you have about the job <laughs> and from talking to your other colleagues in the diplomatic well, from, field? From what I've been told, it's not going to be a bed of roses. It's not, it's not a dry ride. We're not going out there for a nice time. It's a... Uh, situation where people who live in the diaspora, particularly in the United States, they require services, um, consulate services, um, dealing with um, passport and other immigration issues. And um, the number of persons, um, Vincentians, um, who live in the diaspora is quite a high number. Very true. Uh, the, the, the figure of over 400, um, a thousand has been planted. Um, I'm not sure. Um, where recorded, that exactly recorded. but you can imagine that uh, um, uh, uh, a consulate such as New York as as would in New York mm -hmm. would be inundated with um, requests for services requests for um, several kinds of services whatever it is that the consulate is is required to provide so um, we I'll have to hit the ground running <laughs> um, I'm um, taking over from Consul General um, Selman Walters, who has done a tremendous job of um, keeping the ship afloat in that area. And um, I would have to be quickly briefed as, um, and as, as and, quick and, as possible. As, and, you and have as to learn to swim. Uh, well, well, you can't swim. <laughs> well, it's not even a matter of swimming. I'll, I'll have to start diving because I'll be in the deep water with um, wherever my Very head is if, if, as soon as I get there. Mm. So, swimming it's and diving. It's a good thing you have this Nemo experience, right? Uh, and the, the fact that the Olympics were, I would know in the in the in the air mm -hmm. would, would give me a lot of experience of watching the swimming and diving yes, professionals. Yes, so yes, I, yes. I, I'll take up I'll, I'll take a little bit from from them. <laughs> good, good. So how do you feel your experience at Nemo and the other posts you've had? Because I remember you also had a regional post. Yeah. Um, how do you feel this experience would prepare you for New York? I, I think all in all, the sum total of my experience augur very well in relation to the preparation for this kind of job. This job has to do with dealing with people. It, it, it is a situation where you have to have very good people skills. Um, in earlier times, I'd worked for the United Nations, UNDP, in um, Trinidad and Tobago. So I have had some stint at living the, 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 the diplomatic life, so Good. to speak. Mm -hmm. I spent all, over two years in Trinidad and Tobago doing that. Um, in Nemo, it was a situation of um, having to interface with the local people, provide the, the, the services locally. But at the same time, it, it meant that we had to have relationships with organizations and persons in regional the diaspora, and regional, regional and international. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with a lot of international organizations, the OS, the UN, and UN, um, the whole slew of, of UN organizations, UNDP. Um, they have brought and have you know, brought to the table resources that we make available to the people of St. Vincent Grenadines, even when I'm at NEMO. And although there are several other um, 
Vincentian organizations, for, for example, there's um, Ambassador King and her um, outfit at the UN, who will interface directly with the UN and other um, similar um, organizations. I also think that from time to time, the, the, the Council General Office, um, the Consulate would have to interface with organizations. I know recently there has been um, a, a, the formulation of um, relationship with Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. where we are, we are twinning sister countries, um, well, St. Vincent and Grenadines uh, to a, a twinning, being twinned to a city in the United States. That's something that we'll have to continue to make work to see how can we um, get the best out of these cities to provide services to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines? What can we transfer? Um, is it a question of transferring knowledge? Is it a, a question of getting expertise transferred or resources, whatever they are? So while I worked at Nemo, I worked assiduously to get resources to St. Vincent and the Grenadines to provide this to the, to the needs of persons. I, in a very similar way, I'll be doing a similar job in New York. So uh, I guess the, the training and the yes. experience goes well in relation to uh, um, interfacing uh, with having organizations and being ready and people, yeah. for this new assignment. Yeah, and at a NEMO, you're so, we're all supposed to be ready in, in case there's a call of an emergency. So you'll be in a state of readiness. Well, that, that's a general idea. Okay. So I don't have any more questions, but if you have anything else you want to say. Well, I'm, I'm just very happy to be given this opportunity to, again, um, provide service to the people of St. Vincent and the Grandines. Um, during this week, we have had a lot of food for thought, first of all, from the uh, featured speech delivered by the Prime Minister in relation to St. Vincent and the Grandines um, foreign policies. What, does it, what, what, what do we stand for? Um, what am I representing? What am I looking for when I go out to represent St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Um, we also heard from the um, um, Foreign Minister, um, our, um, Sir Louis Stricker. Yes. And all week long, we have been getting presentations from Ambassador um, King uh, from the UN, from High Commissioner Lewis from, from, from the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, we would hear from other ambassadors and learn from them what, what is the work that they're doing and how can the New York con um, Consulate peer with them, work with them to continue to be sure that the best service that is available is provided to Vincentians abroad. And that's what I aim to do. I aim to serve. I aim to listen. I aim to learn. But at the same time, I, I aim to be able to bring what level of expertise that I have amassed through the years to this job so that at the end of my stint as Council General, I would be able to look back and say, well, it was useful. It provided services that people require. And Vincentians are generally better off from the work that has been done. That would be the legacy that I would want to leave. Good. So I wish you all the best. And when you go to New York, safe travels. And as you said, you leave a positive legacy. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. And again, finally, uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't say thanks to the supporting cast, all those people who supported me when I was director of NEMO. It's teamwork. I could not have done what was done without the support of the staff, first of all, and volunteers, the community, district, um, people, uh, persons, and um, particularly the uh, personnel from government agencies, as well as several non-government agencies that work together to make sure that as a team, we can make things better for the people of St. Vincent and the Grandin. So I'd have to say thank you very much for allowing me to be in a position where although I'm leading, I'm still a team member and yes. I'm following and, and, and still doing all as necessary. Thank you very much and I certainly look forward to a similar sort of um, opportunity in New York to work with people because there are several Vincentian organizations in New York that uh, I know would be looking forward to um, continuing the work that they're doing but also to extend it in, in, in different ways and, yes. to, and to enrich it. 
and I hope that I'll be able to lend the sort of support that they need in advancing their work and the course of what is being done, all in the interest of advancing the foreign policies as set out by the government of St. Vincent and Grenadines, but more so of um, making sure that Vincentians here and abroad enjoy a better standard of life. Okay, thank you so much and all the best to you. Thank you. We are continuing our interviews with the new assignees who have been assigned to overseas posts. We have with us Ambassador Ellsworth John, who formerly was in charge of the Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit. Well, Ambassador. As of now, I'm, I'm still the Director of the You're Regional Integration director. and Diaspora Unit, but I'm the uh, Ambassador to Cuba Designate. Designate. And, uh, what they're doing there in the process of going through the procedures, you know, uh, once a person has been identified for a particular diplomatic post, it has to go to service commission. For the recommendation is made by cabinet to service commission. Then it is sent to the governor general, who then signs off on the appointment um, to overseas diplomatic post. So this consultation, is it like a sort of a handing over no, actually it is a consultation that is supposed to have been held every year by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for all of the, the overseas heads of missions. And this year it is coincidental that, the, that this is being held at the same time that the cabinet had decided to make some changes in terms of the, the persons in the overseas missions. So from what you've gotten from the consultation so far, um, what topics, if you can disclose, what topics have been discussed and what, what have you learned so far? Well, basically, the, the, this, this particular consultation is, is focusing on the strategic um, direction going forward for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and its overseas missions and the approaches that we should be taking um, as we carry out our duties in the various missions. For myself in, in Cuba, we, we established an embassy there 11 years ago. And this is my second time around as the, the ambassador, ambassador to Cuba. Okay. While serving as the ambassador and permanent representative in Washington, um, to the United States and to the Organization of American States. I also served as the concurrent non-ambassador, um, non-resident non ambassador, ambassador to Cuba. And when the decision was taken 11 years ago to um, open an embassy in Havana, right. then um, His Excellency Dexter Rose um, became the, the ambassador. And it's, it's a coincidence, like, I guess, that I am now he's, he's taking over. He's coming home you're taking I'm over. I'm now taking over from, from Ambassador Rose as the resident ambassador in Cuba. And I must say that it is at a very exciting time because, as you know, the, the relationship with Cuba and the United, United States. States in particular has seen some softening in recent times, we had the visit by President Obama, uh, first pre president in, in over 50 years mm -hmm. that, that has gone to, to Cuba. And so we expect that there will be some changes. So it is an, it is an exciting time as we, we try to observe what is, what is happening in, in Cuba and be in a position to assess how we can um, work with the Cuban government to all mutual benefits during this period of transition. Okay. I understand that the theme for this week is re-engineering economic growth and development in the 21st century through diplomacy. How, how does the work, or how will the work that you do, I think you alluded to it just now, to work to the mutual benefit of both countries, the, the work that diplomats do, the work that you will do and would have done in your previous post. How does that contribute to development in St. Vincent? And well, Canada? diplomats overseas don't operate in a vacuum. True. We have to, we have to operate within the framework of the priorities of the sending state, in this case, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Yes. 
As you know, there is an economic development plan that has been um, produced. I think it ends in 2025 and started in it's a 2015 to 25, or 2010 to 20, 20, 25, you know. And this is the Bible, basically in terms of how we approach our work. And during the course of this week, some of what we do would be to look at what happens and what the program is from the various ministries mm -hmm. in terms of carrying out that economic development plan and how our roles overseas in the mission would feed into being able to, to implement that, that economic plan. I suppose, like maybe from meetings after meetings, consultations, agendas would change, priorities would change as you know, as times change and so on. The, the, the structure and the framework for, for economic development is, is, is kind of, the, there are broad guidelines mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the document. And we are, we have in meetings with various ministries starting tomorrow. And during the course of those meetings, we will get a sense as to how those ministries are taking the broad guidelines that are outlined in the document. I think there are five strategic areas. And they will take those broad outlines and how they are implementing them and how they see the overseas missions mm -hmm. fitting in to what they are doing. Because our, our agenda really is to support the domestic agenda and to ensure that there's benefit that will come to St. Vincent and the Venetians. True. The construction of the Agal International Airport is a, a major, a major development project in St. Vincent and Grenadines. It is. And Cuba would have given its support among other countries. What type of impact or how do you think this would tie in to your work? Well, you're meeting people in the diaspora and of course you're meeting new people, some of whom might not know about St. Vincent. How does this tie in in the overall development? and promotion of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Well, it, it, makes, it makes our job easier. I, I recall, I, I spent seven years as the ambassador to the United States previously. And when you speak to potential investors, the first thing they would ask you is, you know, about travel, transport, transport and communications. Now, our communication has been pretty good with um, cable and wireless at the time, line now, and the various different um, technology that we have available to us. The question, the big question for them has been transportation. Transportation, yes. And now that the international airport is, is coming on stream, and the persons who have come and visited have seen the advances that have been made in terms of finalizing that project, there is a lot of interest and enthusiasm for foreign direct investment in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I mean, I would be bold enough to say that I think St. Vincent and the Grenadines is going to be the next frontier for development because of the, to some extent, mm -hmm. to the international airport that we, we have here and the potential that it has for allowing St. Vincent to be a final destination for persons, but also a gateway mm -hmm. to other destinations. The kinds of contacts that we have had with countries in Latin America, um, be it through our involvement in ALBA, SICA, OAS, and the close ties that we've had with Cuba, Venezuela, for example, and the growing um, links that we've mm -hmm. had with, with some of the others provide a really good opportunity for Simmons and events to be a gateway to Latin America. And it's one of the things that I will be exploring with the authorities and the people in Cuba. Um, the ability to use St. Vincent and the Grandis as a tourism destination, especially given the contribution that they have made mm -hmm. um, to our international airport. So from your past experience of being in Cuba, even though it was a non-resident right. um, situation, what are you looking forward to? What do you love about Cuba? Oh, okay, Cuba well, is a great place. Cuba is, um, the culture of Cuba is very rich and looking forward to, to learning something from, from that. One of my pet projects, you know, initiatives that I, I tried to advance um, previously 
because at the time I was non-resident to Cuba, I was also non-resident to Venezuela and Mexico. And I tried to put together a program, a cultural program for teaching music to students in our school so that we could have a really good youth orchestra coming out of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And knowing how culturally rich Cuba is, it is one of the areas that I will be hoping to, to do some promotion in to see how they can assist us culturally here in St. Vincent and Grenadines to advance among our youth a love and appreciation for music of different types. That's good. That sounds like a good idea. So Thank you. If you don't have, you're welcome. If you don't have any final comments. Well, I'm just, I'm just looking forward to the, this, this new experience. Um, it's been nine years since I've been ambassador to CARICOM and, and OECS. And so it's going to be an interesting change for me. As you know, it is always good to refresh. And having been now in the diplomatic service for over 20 years, um, this is going to be, being resident in Cuba, I think it's going to be an enriching experience for me and hopefully I'll be able to use that experience to the benefit of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thank you. Thank All you very much. All the best to you and enjoy Cuba. Thank you. You're welcome. We certainly wish the new ambassadors a successful tenure. And that is how we end this evening's presentation from the Agency for Public Information. Thank you very much for viewing. I trust that you found it to be quite informative. Do join us again on Thursday DV at 8 p.m. when we will be back with another presentation from the API. Until next time, I am Shanna Daniel. Good night and God bless.